All right, I guess we're going to make maple syrup. So the first thing we need are sugar maple trees, and we do have quite a few of those in the UP in Michigan. So you're looking at a bunch here. Um, there's also some birch trees and stuff, and you actually can make syrup from uh, other kinds of trees, including birch trees. So Originally, I was going to have Wade. That's the gentleman right there, Grandpa Wade. Um, I was going to have him dictate, narrate the whole video um, but it kind of got complicated and everything uh, with explanations now here I'm tapping a tree um, tapping it you usually drill about you know one and a half to two inches in the tree has to be at least 10 inches in diameter and if it's more than 18 inches in diameter you can put more than one tap in it and you have to be wary of where you tap the tree the previous year um, you don't want everything in the line so you want to be at least a foot apart from the other where you tapped it the previous year. There's a, a metal spigot spout. Um, most of them, most people nowadays use them. Made them or they're made out of plastic, which people use. So this is a metal one. Um, and it's been used many times. You can see the sap already starting to drip out of it. So One gallon ice cream pail. And we put a little nail to hang that on. And that's about it. 139 more trees or taps to go. So and that's it. Weed's kind of camera shy. After you get all your, your buckets out, you need uh, what we call picking the sap. Um, where, you, where you go and collect it now. We call this the Wade Mobile. It's a Kawasaki mule, and Wade's made a little platform for the rear end of it there, and he's got a couple of 33-gallon uh, garbage cans that are used only for sap, and basically you go picking, and you, everybody carries a five-gallon bucket, and you go from tree to tree and pour the smaller one-gallon ice cream buckets, pails, into your five-gallon bucket, and then you'll dump that into the... 33 gallon garbage cans so you know if you have a couple of people helping you pick it goes rather quickly but if, if you're doing it by yourself you're gonna be better you're gonna it's gonna be an hour so when uh, we try to keep there's a long driveway slash road going down to the sugar shack and we try to keep the taps within 15 feet of the the road so you don't have to walk too far into the snow because the snow is a little deeper this year normally we've lost a little more snow by this time so <coughs> there's weed picking the problem I have is I'm so tall and everybody else is so short that they have a tendency to put the buckets a little low my back usually gets a little sore by the few days of doing it. And normally you only pick once a day, usually in the evening. You know, 5 o'clock is a, is a good time to pick. Um, and ideally you want you, know, you want it to freeze at night. Um, colder the better. Well, you want right around 20 degrees. If you could get it 20 degrees at night and 40 degrees during the day, you'll get a good sap, right? especially if the sun's out. Here's Ken. I call him Ken in law. He's from Chicago, so we have to keep sharp objects and guns away from him, or he might hurt himself. But other than that, he's a pretty good guy. So it's just big city. So in there, we're dumping into the garbage can. So once we you finish picking, um, or if you get quite a bit of sap in the in the garbage cans, you're going to do a drop off. And what this is, you're going to put it into the holding tank. So. We'll see how we do that. We use a, a submersible pump that uh, Wade has rigged up. It, it used to be just by pails. You would, you know, you stick a one-gallon container in there and you'd, you'd uh, put it, you know, transfer it to the holding pump. But Wade's come up with a pretty nice uh, pump system, so it'll save your back. So that's like a horse drinking uh, trough is the holding uh, container. It holds 100 gallons. It's black. 
picked up on the table. There's also two more 33 gallon um, garbage cans right there that can also be used to um, hold extra sap. Okay, turn the pump on and you transfer the, the sap into the holding tank. So you can keep sap for a while um, as long as it's, you know, it's, it's cool out uh, less than 40 degrees, the sap will keep so it doesn't have to be boiled right away. But this is not, this is a nice setup that he has here. Okay, so now we tap the trees, we pick the sap, we're dumping the sap into the holding tank. You can see it's almost to the top, so there's almost 100 gallons um, in there, plus what's in the pan already. I can't remember by this point how many gallons he's actually boiled down in the pan already, the evaporating pan. So this is just a, l a little, you know, private operation. It's not commercial. Um, now the maple syrup gets sold. Probably average 20 gallons a year, maybe. Uh, and that's just given out to friends and family. Also make some, you know, taffy, uh, maple syrup taffy and candy. And okay, here's the holding tank. As I say, it's just a regular trough, a uh, drinking trough for like a horse. And then it's tapped down at the bottom. And this goes into the evaporation pan. And you can see on the end of the line there, there's a, a valve with a float on it. It's just like the back of your toilet. In fact, that's what that thing is. That's a, a, an old ball, an old copper ball from a, from a toilet. And it, it regulates the level of the syrup. Because you don't want too much and you don't want too little. Otherwise, it'll burn. Um, this operation, oh, it's time to eat. We, uh, we're big on fish fries uh, in Michigan. And usually, uh, the fish we normally consume, uh, perch, walleye and uh, whitefish are some of the common ones along with trout and salmon but I I personally eat you know mostly uh, perch and, and whitefish and walleye so the evaporation is going now it's kind of a waiting game there's Ken it's just a waiting game um, we can boil off around 10 gallons an hour so if you've got 120 gallons, like I think we have it there, about 120, it's going to take about 12 hours of boil time. So I should probably have shown you around. There's the the white building is the boiling part of the sugar shack, and then this part is is like the kitchen, uh, living room. <laughs> um, that little it's also got a bathroom attached to it with uh, running water and everything. It's got its own septic field. Uh, most everything inside is run by propane. So you go in here, and this is what I painted in an earlier video that I shot. So there's the old uh, antique uh, farm kitchen wood stove. So, and this is primarily, you know, this, you know, heat up water um, and use it to heat the, heat the shack. So, and the fire's uh, going. So, but it's a nice little area. It's... Uh, Got HD TV. Um, in previous years, he's put the satellite dish out there, but he, uh, he didn't do it this year. There's the, the propane heater in the over in the corner you just saw there. That was something new this year because he said it was awful cold in the morning, so he was using that to take the edge off before the wood stove would would heat up. So we sit in here and eat our pancakes and have big meals. For some reason, Callie really did not want to be on camera. I'm not sure why. So, but there's uh, Grandma Marlene. So, everybody was uh, we're eating a pretty good sized meal there. So, having a fish fry. So, lots of food. So, now back to work. I hold the camera and give orders. We like the ladies to do all the heavy lifting here in the UP. So, Sanders getting ready to stoke the fire. So you do go through a lot of wood um, during maple season time. 
I, I know some people, and if they're just doing a small batch, or maybe making one gallon a year, maybe they'll use propane for the whole uh, process. But uh, that would be a little outrageous when you're trying to make 20 gallons. I can't possibly imagine how much propane you'd go through. So everything is wood. There's the firebox. The firebox is actually open on the top, and that pan is, is uh, so it can have direct access to the flames. So there's no top on that besides that pan. This is a pretty typical uh, uh, sugaring process here. Um, everybody has their own little methods and, and setup, but all in all, this is pretty typical. see the fire through the crack there as I say it's an open top. And if you have all the doors shut in there it's kind of like a sauna. I thought I'd throw this in. Um, I don't want to say it's a rare wheel horse but they just weren't as common as, as some of the other ones. This is a D160 with a loader. This thing is heavy duty. And I will be making uh, videos just of this. I'll take that out and use it. I think I'm going to have to bring it to my house uh, to get a little work done on a few projects I have this summer anyway. So, but it's a nice shape. I know you wheel horse guys uh, really uh, will enjoy videos of that. So here's the old Ford. So when uh, this time of year, when the permafrost is still in the ground, but yet you have melting, I mean, it really makes everything soupy. You know, the top foot of ground uh, just gets horribly mushy, and be, there's big ruts everywhere you drive. So it got pretty bad at the end of the road. So. I was going to take the, the Ford out, it's a little cold blooded here, I'm just letting it warm up. So I was uh, going to take this out and try to smooth off the ruts at the end of the road because they're getting pretty bad. So. Wade rebuilt this tractor, um, I think, the 80s, I'm not really sure. Um, I told him uh, maybe we should repaint the tins on it. I don't know if he's going to go for that idea or not, but it uh, sure runs nice. And he's got a he's got a brush hog for it uh, and uh, a few other attachments. There's the back blades on it. You see how the back blades turned around. Uh, and then that's, you know, for when you go forward, it, may, it works well for smoothing, smoothing off the road. You can see how much snow we still have. And actually, uh, Easter Sunday, we got another two inches. So. You can see how rutted up the, the road is. The problem is the the Ford doesn't have the best down pressure. Uh, I would have liked to have been able to apply a little more down pressure. It's almost just floats. So, but it still worked. I just had to make multiple passes.
course, I don't need much of an excuse to jump on a tractor and drive it around a little bit. When I was uh, putting the tractor away, I noticed we had a bald eagle in the field. So they're quite common up by the highway because uh, they like to eat the roadkill deer and other animals. So we usually don't get them, get them down here. Stoke the fire again, that's all you do. Stoke the fire. And it's hot. You're sitting on the benches. Uh, you definitely know it on your legs. Okay, here's the tricky part. You slide a piece of metal underneath the evaporation pan because I said it's open. You see the fire down there. And this didn't go too smoothly this time. I'm not sure why, but it, it got caught on something. But you, you slide a piece of metal underneath the pan. Okay, the metal's under the pan. Now you raise the evaporation pan and you open up the two valves at the bottom and let it drain into buckets. And if Wade did everything right, he's looking at about two gallons, he thinks. He likes to make two, ba two gallon batches. There's his cable he's got for tilting it up. The buckets are filling. Now when, those, when the, the sap is boiling hot, and to get it to this stage, you have to have a candy thermometer in there. Um, and I think we pulled this one off at 218, 218 degrees. So, all right, now it's shut the valves in the evaporation pan. Quickly open up the valve, the float valve, all the way, and then get the sap from the holding tank in there. And while that's happening, the two people have to strain the, the syrup. You get something in the syrup and it's called uh, sugar sand, or it's just sand, sometimes people call it. And it's impurities, it's minerals and stuff that were in the trees, and they crystallize, and it, it, it really is kind of like a sand. Um, so you run it through a uh, filtering system. It's like a felt filter, and inside that there's a, a paper filter. But the syrup will only go through it when it's boiling hot. If it starts to cool down, we all know how sticky maple syrup is, and you will never get it through that filter. So, so they're filtering that. And it seems like I think John's went through real easy. And that's, that's on the left side, and Sandra down on the right side. I don't think hers uh, filtered as easily. And you have to use the tongs and, and squeeze the, the, the paper filter. This improves clarity and as I say, it gets the, the sand out of the, the maple syrup. As I say, you pull it off right at, you know, 218 degrees, 217, 218. Um, everything's about timing and, and temperatures with maple syrup. A couple of degrees off either way, and you can burn it on the pan, you can burn it on the evaporator, um, or it can be too runny, or you can have, uh, it can be too dry. So, And we, th we think Wade's candy thermometer is off a degree. Um, that's normally, we would pull it off at like 217, um, but we actually finish it at 220 when technically it should be finished at 219, but we think it's his ca uh, candy thermometer um, is off. We also go by the hydrometer. All right, pulling, filled up the pan. There's probably, you know, a good 10 gallons in there or so. And then pulling out the sheet of steel to get it back on top of the firebox. <coughs> Straighten it out. Then you set the float for the right height that you want the, the syrup level. Good to go. 
Okay, this is how we finish the syrup. The syrup is one to two degrees from being finished, okay? So now it sits on a turkey roaster in a big stainless steel pan and it's got uh, stainless steel spouts and, and everything attached to it, welded to it. But you put it in here, you light the, the turkey fryer and you get it boiling and you have to sit there. You cannot leave this because you'll have a foam up and you'll, you'll ruin it. Um, you'll have foam all over the place. So you gotta be careful so you can regulate the temperature on it. So there's the hydrometer. We finish it, You, when the hydrometer says it's ready and the temperature is, on Wade's thermometer it's 220. So. It's basically seven uh, degrees above the boiling point of water. There's John in his awesome hat. There's Trent who's also camera shy. Sandra is complaining her hands are sticking. She wants to go in the house and wash them. That's okay. I'm going to finish it anyway. So I sit there with the candy thermometer dunked in there. And I, I tried to focus in to be able to show you the reading on the candy thermometer. And it's, I think it's at about 218, 217, 218 right there. So I'm not the best cameraman. We all know that. So. Okay, you fill the hydrometer up. The syrup. Look how that looks darker than it really was. I don't know if it's the camera or whatever, but it, it was it was a darker syrup. But um, for some reason, it looks really it looks like it's a class B almost right there. But I don't think it was. So we're taking a hydrometer reading, and that's uh, specific gravity. You know, they, anybody who's made beer, wine, or anything else, they you know what a hydrometer is. Okay, we finished it in the pan. Now Wade is putting it in glass jars. You have to make sure the jars aren't ice cold because you can shatter them putting in uh, hot syrup. So, and he leaves them in glass jars um, and there's a settling process because any sand that uh, you didn't get out with the filtering, um, cloudiness or anything, it'll settle to the bottom. And then when Marlene goes to bottle it, she reheats it up and she makes sure that she doesn't use the, you know, the very bottom portion where all the sediment is, if there is any sediment. So, but they store it in glass jugs until season's over and Marlene, uh, you have to heat it up to uh, at least 180 degrees again um, and then pour it into your containers and then uh, when you put the lids on it'll self-seal it. So, but I think Marlene usually brings it to a boil again. So that's it. We have uh, we've made maple syrup. So uh, commercially, if I'm not sure what maple syrup is going for, I know class A or fancy. This uh, I, I'm not sure. I uh, you know I think that right there would be a, a dark class A. And uh, I seventy five dollars a gallon maybe is what it's going for. I'm not really sure. So I actually, I grew up with uh, Aunt Jemima. So it's, uh, but this is absolutely wonderful, wonderful stuff. And it's a, it's a good family tradition. It, it really is. So, and I'm trying to learn as, as much as I can. And um, so is everybody else, you know, so the, Everybody's grandkids and nieces and everything, you know, throughout the years, they can partake in this. So. And there's the second gallon. So that's two gallons of, uh, of syrup. And I'm not sure if, I can't remember if he got another quart or so out of that, this batch or not, so. This is good, clean uh, family fun on Easter Easter weekend. I would, you know, honestly, I'm much more comfortable doing this than uh, going to Florida and the Disney World and land where I, whatever it is, and uh, going on the rides and whatnot. Sorry, Mom, I know you're in Cocoa Beach right now. 
No, <laughs> there is nothing better than fresh, warm syrup. And I put it on everything. It really is good on hash browns and eggs and especially good on ham. I don't want you to think it's just for pancakes. We eat a lot of pancakes, don't get me wrong. But this syrup is absolutely wonderful as a topping like that. Oh, it was delicious. So this is what happens when you get too much sugar in you. The funny thing is, uh, that's a right-handed holster, and I'm actually left-handed. But that's my Ruger Single Six. It's probably my favorite 22 pistol. That's funny, because this kid was in the house playing video games a minute ago, and he heard the booms, and everybody has to come out. I, uh, I had shot a raccoon the night before that was getting in the garage. So... Sandra's a little worried. We're all going to make fun of her because I got the camera on her. I promised her I would not put it on the internet. She's actually a pretty good shot, though. I am a firearms instructor for the state of Michigan, and I, I try to teach the, all the nieces and nephews and whoever. I try to give them some, some pretty good safety instructions before we uh, play with any firearms. And that's it. That was uh, that was Easter weekend. Um, I'm sorry this is so long, and I I literally had another 45 minutes of <laughs> videotape I, I could have used, but I think you guys got the gist of uh, gist of it. So as I say, this is basically uh, for friends and family. So hope everybody else had a nice Easter, and until next time.